During the Roman occupation of Egypt from 30 BC to 14 AD, the canal of the pharaohs was maintained and improved. During this period, trade flourished in the region. Greek, Egyptian, and other merchants passed daily over the desert, both by ship on the canal and overland in great caravans. They carried the wealth of the east to trade for Roman gold. In the seventh century, at the time of the Muslim domination of Egypt, it was rebuilt by order of the Caliph Omar. The canal remained in use for another century, but then the desert reclaimed it. This time, it stayed buried for a thousand years. Trade now moved exclusively overland, via caravan. But there were obstacles. Arab desert raiders were taking a toll. And even if these could be avoided, the pirates of the Red Sea were a constant threat. Then in 1498, the Portuguese explorer Vasco da Gama reached India by sailing for the first time around the Cape of Good Hope. The route took longer than going overland, but it was considered a great deal safer. Even with that particular change, a lot of trade continues to go through land. Uh, and in, in a sense, uh, there was always this dream of being uh, able to finally connect the Red Sea to the Mediterranean, and thus in the process, reduce the length of the trip. By the end of the 15th century, the Egyptian link in the chain of trade was broken. Trade with the East was dominated for the next four centuries by the British, Dutch, and Portuguese merchant ships who sailed around the southern tip of Africa, a journey that took four months. In 1850, Europe was in the middle of the Industrial Revolution, undergoing enormous social and economic change. The old aristocracy was losing its hold, and wealth was pouring into the hands of the new middle class. Trade with the Far East was no longer a luxury. Now it was essential for Europe's economic growth. The factories of England and the continent needed copra, jute, ore, and cotton. In 1845, the first railway line in Egypt was completed. It connected the Mediterranean port of Alexandria with the Red Sea port of Suez. This service was a boon to passengers, but it did little to silence the demand for cargo space. It's a limit how much a railway line can carry in terms of passengers and shipping, whereas through a canal you can have any number of ships going through. At this same time, a maritime revolution was taking place. Steamships with screw propellers and iron hulls were replacing the old wooden sailing ships. Now there were ships capable of carrying enormous loads of goods from the east. But the trip around the Cape still took far too long. The eyes of the world once again fell on the Isthmus of Suez. In 1798, Napoleon and his troops had invaded and occupied Egypt. At that time, the chief French engineer of the expedition, a man named Le Père, surveyed the Isthmus of Suez to determine the feasibility of a canal. The engineer concluded that there was a 30-foot difference in water level between the Mediterranean and the Red Sea. Building a canal between them, he reported, would be impossible. That particular fear was completely alleviated by additional surveys that were made uh, in the late 1840s. Um, and uh, in a sense, even though the surveys proved that what you're dealing with is the same water level, it was not until the actual opening of the canal in 1869, almost 20 years later, that everybody's fears were now proven to be wrong. A thousand years had passed since the desert sands had covered over the canal of the pharaohs. In that time, Egypt had come to be ruled by many conquerors. Now, in the mid-19th century, the world was ready and eager for a canal to revive the ancient trade routes for the modern era. But the Ottoman Turks, who ruled Egypt, were not interested. Neither was Muhammad Ali, the former Turkish general, now viceroy of Egypt. Muhammad Ali needed to be convinced a canal through the Suez would be in her best interest. In 1854, a well-born young Frenchman named Ferdinand de Lesseps set out to do just that. Throughout his rule in the early part of the 19th century, 
Muhammad Ali had been urged by his European advisors to authorize a canal through the Isthmus of Suez. But the Egyptian leader offered a deaf ear. Ferdinand de Lesseps, a young French diplomat and engineer, was acquainted with Muhammad Ali and his family. De Lesseps had read the account of Napoleon's expeditions in Egypt in 1798 and believed strongly that a canal could and should be built. He also knew that if he wished to remain in the Viceroy's good graces, he would do well not to mention the subject. Instead, the young consul developed a relationship with Prince Mohammed Said, the Viceroy's son. The prince had a weight problem which displeased his father. The son tended to be obese. So his father, Muhammad Ali, who was very strict, had to put him on a diet. So he would come over to my grandfather's house in order to have decent meals. Moreover, the viceroy wanted him to learn fencing, horse riding, swimming, all the sports that my grandfather was so good at. And the rumor is that Deliceps was the only place where the poor corporal and Said could get a plate of spaghetti. True or not, it makes for a good story. And so uh, a friendship broke out between the two. And when Said became ruler, Deliceps hurried from France and said, I will make your name famous in the world. He did. It was during this reunion with his old friend Said in 1854 that Deliceps began to make his case for building a canal in the Suez. Mohammed Said needed little persuasion. On November 30th, 1854, he drafted what came to be known as the first concession, giving his permission for the creation of a Suez Canal Company. The first director was to be Ferdinand de Lesseps, whom Said referred to as my devoted friend of high rank and exalted birth. It is important to remember that de Lesseps was also an entrepreneur, not just simply an engineer. Uh, he was somebody who envisioned projects and went out and achieved them. The concession was to be in effect for 99 years from the date of opening, and all the necessary land on the isthmus was to be given to the company by the viceroy himself. The canal was to be open to ships of all nations. 15% of the profits were to go to the Egyptian government, 75% to the canal company, which would be made up of private investors, and 10% to the original investors who gave de Lesseps his working capital. My great-grandfather was ambitious, but was ambitious on the right way. He was uh, ready to dedicate all his energy to all projects that can uh, bring uh, the idea of progress. He was very uh, close to Egypt when uh, he saw that uh, finally the moment was ready to do it. He jumped on it, and he made in such a way that uh, he, he could not make any personal fortune on, on it. Lesseps tenait beaucoup à ce que le canal soit ouvert à toutes les nations. De Lesseps really wanted the canal to be open to all nations without discrimination. There is an article of concession that says just that. De Lesseps took pains to make sure the Suez Canal Company would be a truly international organization. The first board of directors included representatives of 14 countries. Everything appeared in place to begin construction, but then the British government rose in opposition to the project. When the British learned that the canal was going to be dug, their, their major uh, concern was that it was the French who were going to uh, control the operation and technically be in charge. And initially, there was fear that, re reflecting on their rivalries with the French of the past, that the French might use this against the British, particularly with respect to that route to India. Great Britain's position seemed short-sighted since they had the largest and most powerful fleet in the world and had the most to gain from an operational Suez Canal. Le canal avait un seul défaut. The canal had one fault. It was perfect. Perfect for England, but it was not English. And that's the only reason she was against it. England could not conceive to allow another country to have the key to the route to India.
Great Britain used her influence in European banking circles to prevent De Lesseps from securing a loan for the $40 million the canal was estimated to cost. In desperation, he set up an office in Paris and set about selling shares in the Suez Canal Company to anyone willing to buy them. His plan was to sell 400,000 shares of stock at 500 francs each, about $500. To keep the company as international as possible, he limited the number of shares that could be sold in France to 220,000. The stock sold well. The purchases were mainly from the middle class, thousands of them, who bought on average about nine shares each. Certain financiers s'en moquant disaient. Some financiers would say in a mocking way, "It's a company of waiters." And it is true that originally the capital came from modest people. Eventually, very slowly, the Suez shares became valued by important people, and it was good when your daughter married to have some Suez shares in her dowry. Within a few weeks, De La Sepp sold 207,000 shares of the stock, but he still had nearly 200,000 left unsold. Now he turned to his old friend, Mohammed Saeed. The Egyptian ruler agreed to buy 92,000 of the remaining shares, but when the rest of the shares couldn't be sold, De La Sepps took it on his own to announce that Said had agreed to purchase those too. De La Sepps was a very, very clever entrepreneur. He was also a bit of a crook, uh, which comes through very clearly when he declares that the ruler of Egypt had bought all the unsold shares, which the ruler of Egypt hadn't bought because he didn't have the money to buy them. He simply declared that Said would buy all the unsold shares. And when Said said, hold it, I, I had never said I would buy them. He said, would you have me appear a liar in the eyes of the world? And Said, being gullible and credulous, went along with it and had to borrow 10 million pounds to pay for these shares. Said now owned nearly half interest in the canal, but to pay for his shares, he had to borrow money from the same European bankers who had refused to finance the canal. Only this time, they were happy to oblige him at usurious interest rates. Everybody wanted to buy into the loan because you could borrow money in Europe at 3 and 4% and then invest it in Egypt and get 12 to 30% return on your money. When the money was finally in hand, the project could begin but the financial outlook appeared bleak for Egypt. Said had recklessly committed, or been pressured into committing, funds he didn't have. Construction of the Suez Canal and the financial disintegration of Egypt began at almost the same moment. Construction of the Suez Canal began on the morning of April 25, 1859. The engineers had plotted a route from the Mediterranean to the Red Sea, which encompassed Lake Timsa and the Bitter Lakes. This limited almost by half the distance that would actually have to be dug out, just less than 40 miles. La zone était entièrement un désert. The area was a complete desert. There was nothing besides a small port in Suez on the Red Sea. Challenges were huge. First of all, to bring manpower to work, then to feed them and shelter them. 90% of the work was just digging in the sand. There were very few rocky zones. They had to build the Said port, dig the canal, and also establish the cities of Ismailia and Suez. There were no materials to move huge quantities of sand as we could imagine today. Mohammed Said provided the workforce of 60,000 Egyptian peasants, as per the terms of his second concession to De La Seps. 20,000 men at a time worked in six-month shifts. This unwilling workforce was called corvée labor. Usually, corvée is done on your own region. But they were now removed from the region, taken to the Suez Canal, and forced to fend for themselves. And since their families couldn't be supported 
they followed as well, so it uprooted the whole population. Whether the Egyptians were paid for their labor or even given tools to dig with remains a topic of debate to this day. At least 25,000 Egyptians died digging the canal because the Lisseps neither supplied them with housing, with food, nor even with uh, tools. They had to dig with whatever tools were available. And you have pictures of them digging, some of them with their bare hands. It was quite horrendous. They were paid. They were paid correctly. But they didn't have the chance to say that they have another job to do. They had to do it like a military service. You know, it was an obligation. Digging it with their bare hands relates to the unbelievable oppressive conditions under which the laborers, uh, mostly Egyptians, they were expected to work um, about 18 hours a day. Um, and many of them worked for four, five, and six years before they were finally returned back to their village. Mohammed Said, in addition to donating the labor and the land through which the canal would run, had promised to supply fresh water to the workers. For this, he ordered a separate workforce to dig a fresh water canal from the Nile, 50 miles away. During the five years it took to build the fresh water canal, water was carried overland to the workers by camels. The construction plan for the main canal was to dig out a narrow service ditch all the way from the Mediterranean to the Gulf of Suez. This service ditch, never more than 20 feet wide and six feet deep, would then be widened. out to form the Suez Canal. The workforce was split in two with one team pushing south from Port Said and the other pushing north from Suez. The Egyptians dug through the desert following the route of the pharaohs, the same path dug out by their ancestors, with the same tools, shovels, baskets and bare hands. De Lesseps knew that sooner or later he would need heavy machinery to widen out the service ditch to form the finished canal. But after three years of digging, he still had no idea where this equipment would come from or who would pay for it. Still, he pressed on, believing that the farther the project progressed, the more likely it was to attract new financing. The future would have to take care of itself. While the digging continued, a harbor was being built at Port Said. Two stone breakwaters were formed reaching out into the Mediterranean. 30,000 huge stones, each weighing more than 20 tons, were lowered into the sea. In 1863, nine years after he granted the Suez Canal concession to his friend Ferdinand de Lesseps, Mohammed Said died. He was succeeded as viceroy by his nephew Ismail, who was soon faced with a new crisis. Slavery was a topic very much in the news. The United States was at that moment fighting a civil war over the issue, and world opinion was very much with the abolitionist North. Great Britain seized the opportunity and accused Egypt of using slave labor to build the canal. The British, to be sure, to unbalance the company, made an international campaign against the Corvée. So finally, the corvée has been abolished everywhere in Egypt, include the Suez Canal worksite. In the spring of 1864, Ismail reluctantly sent his workforce home. But this move only compounded his troubles. Egypt's contract with De Lesseps and the Canal Company required Ismail to supply the labor. If he couldn't supply corvée labor, he would have to provide the cash to hire paid workers or buy dredging machines. But he had no cash. Now, like his uncle before him, he was forced to borrow more money from European bankers at high interest rates. De Lesseps used the money to buy new dredging equipment from France. No precedent for the dredges existed since the world had never seen an engineering problem like this before. The machines were steam-powered and set up on barges in the canal. 
From wooden towers, an endless chain of buckets scooped mud from the canal bottom. Long chutes deposited the mud on the banks of the canal or onto other barges that carried it out to sea. The dredges followed the path of the service ditch, widening it out. Dredging was so much faster and cheaper than dry excavation that the terrain was artificially flooded and dredged whenever possible. These dredges were capable of digging out the canal at an astounding rate of six million cubic feet a month. Progress on the canal quickened dramatically. Early fears that the canal once dug would immediately fill back up with drifting sand proved unfounded. The mud from the bottom of the canal made good cement for the banks, baked rock hard by the sun. La coupe, une coupe du canal. The shape of the canal is a trapezoid. You have the banks, then flat places, then it angles to the bottom and the bottom is flat. By 1869, after 10 years of digging, the canal was large enough to accommodate ocean-going vessels. On the day it opened, the Suez Canal was 26 feet deep, with a minimum bottom width of 72 feet and a surface width of some 175 feet. During the last year of construction, new harbors and towns were completed at Port Said and Ismailia. The freshwater canal extended the length of the waterway. On August 15, 1869, the Red Sea flowed along the channel from Suez and poured into the bitter lakes, blending with water from the Mediterranean. The opening of the Suez Canal in 1869 uh, uh, was an event uh, of uh, great proportions. Uh, international guests were invited from all over the world to attend the ceremony itself. The celebration lasted for days. Ismail paid for the lavish festivities with borrowed funds. He spent 15 million pounds, which at that time was a great deal of money, built the Cairo Opera House, Verdi wrote Aida, which wasn't ready in time for the opening of the canal, but was later on. On November 17, 1869, a royal yacht carrying the Empress Eugenie of France, Ferdinand de Lesseps, and other dignitaries steamed into the completed Suez Canal. The world had its waterway, but for Egypt, the price tag would be higher than she ever could have imagined. The Suez Canal's opening in 1869 was well-timed in that it coincided with the world manufacturing boom accompanying the Industrial Revolution. There were suddenly more products for sale than at any previous time in history. Shipments of products between East and West that once took months to go around the Cape of Good Hope were now reaching their destinations in short weeks. As transportation costs lessened, prices dropped. A new emerging middle class, flush with their factory wages, found they could now afford what once had been out of reach. It facilitated trade and commerce enormously. It allowed a number of European investors to make enormous quantities of money. It allowed for the smooth sailing to India so that England could send its armies to India much easier than before, and the French to Indochina. The name Ferdinand de Lesseps was being spoken all over the world. His canal was hailed as a technological triumph, and just as he had predicted, it was benefiting all nations, all except Egypt. Que le canal de Suez est beaucoup apporté à l'Égypte. I'm not sure that the Suez Canal brought a lot to Egypt itself. Ships would pass through, maybe pick up coal at Port Said, but they would not bring important resources to Egypt. I do not think very honestly that the canal brought economic prosperity to Egypt. By 1875, Egypt was facing bankruptcy and no financier in Europe would loan her any more money. Her last major source of income, her cotton crop, had been mortgaged a decade earlier to pay for canal dredges. Now those payments were due, and her only other source of income was her half interest in the Suez Canal. And even though 5,000 ships were passing through the canal annually, her portion of the collected tolls was not nearly enough to pay off her creditors. Out of desperation, 
Ismail sought a buyer for Egypt shares in the Suez Canal Company. One quickly appeared in the form of Egypt's old nemesis, the British government. When Benjamin Disraeli, the British Prime Minister, heard Ismail's shares were for sale, he acted swiftly. On a weekend, without seeking authorization from Parliament, Disraeli offered Egypt $20 million for the shares. Ismail accepted. Disraeli immediately sent a message to the Queen which read simply, You have it, Madam. England, the nation who had done everything she could to prevent the Suez Canal from being built, now owned half of it. Egypt, whose people had labored for years to dig out the canal, whose commitment to the project had plunged her into bankruptcy, no longer owned any part of the venture. This transaction also marked the beginning of the end for Ismail, who was deposed a short time afterward. Within 15 years, the shares Disraeli bought would be worth seven times what he paid for them. Great Britain's purchase of the canal shares gave her a foot in the door into Egypt's internal affairs. Only a few years later, she would barge her way through. In 1882, nationalist Egyptians revolted against Khedive Tafig, Ismail's successor. The rebel leaders wanted freedom from the outside governments which had controlled Egypt for centuries. Seeking to protect their investment, the British invaded. The rebellion was quickly put down, but the British stayed. The British colonized Egypt because of the canal. They used the excuse that there was a, a nationalist movement in Egypt. The real reason is they were afraid the canal would be blocked. The British occupied Egypt for the next 75 years. The Suez Canal would prove to be a great strategic asset to Great Britain in both world wars. The British have a superb navy. They don't have manpower. They need manpower from their colonies to fight wars. And the manpower comes through the Suez Canal because it comes from Australia, New Zealand. They also had all the Indians and Burmese in their army. You couldn't do it without the Suez Canal. Now, in theory, the canal is an open international waterway. In both wars, it was closed to the other side. But without the canal, nothing would have reached England. It wouldn't have been able to fight a war. The first half of the 20th century had seen the Egyptian population double. With few natural resources to draw from, the standard of living declined. But through it all, the canal prospered. In 1936, Britain ended its official control of the Egyptian government, but remained a solid presence there backing their puppet, King Farouk. Then in 1952, King Farouk was deposed in a bloodless coup carried out by a group of army officers. Their leader, Gamal Abdel Nasser, took over as head of the new government becoming the first true Egyptian to rule Egypt since the middle of the 6th century BC. Within a few short years, his destiny and that of the Suez Canal would become inextricably linked. Nasser was now the head of an impoverished nation, which lacked enough cultivatable soil to feed its rapidly increasing population. The answer, he and others believed, was to dam the River Nile at Aswan in southern Egypt thereby creating a means to increase the agricultural output of the Nile Valley. Not only would food production increase by an estimated one-third, but the hydroelectric plant in the proposed dam would bring electricity to millions of rural Egyptians, giving them a boost into the 20th century. Without the dam, the outlook for Egypt was bleak. The prospect of mass starvation within the foreseeable future was very real. But the cost of the Aswan Dam was estimated to be a billion dollars. Like his predecessors a century before, Nasser turned to the wealthy nations for a loan. But the Cold War was in full swing, and the Western powers, specifically the United States, believed Nasser had sympathies for the Soviet bloc. Nasser was not a communist, hated the communists. He was determined not to have communist influence come in, into Egypt. On July 19, 1956, the Egyptian president's request for a loan was rejected. Angry and humiliated, Nasser played what he believed was his final card. 
One week after the World Bank's decision, Egyptian troops seized the only reliable source of revenue in Egypt. On the 26th of the July, Gamal Abdel Nasser nationalized the Suez Canal and the argument he put forward, which was enthusiastically received by the Egyptians, was that this would provide the cash for the high dam. The canal's owners, France and Britain, were enraged. In concert with Israeli forces, the two countries invaded Egypt and occupied the canal territory. It appeared that Egypt would once again fall under the control of foreign nations. But then, a pair of unlikely champions emerged in her behalf. The Americans and the Soviets um, felt that it was inappropriate for the British and the French to occupy uh, the um, Suez Canal region without complete and full consultation with them. Of course, we have to remember that this was the British Empire, this was still the French Empire. Both countries were operating from an imperial regime mentality. Egypt's triumph in nationalizing the Suez Canal was, in a sense, the moment that ended the reign of uh, Britain uh, over the world as a British Empire. Pressured by the United States and the Soviet Union, the United Nations ordered Britain and France to withdraw from the Canal Zone. Israel was ordered to leave the Sinai Peninsula. The withdrawal was humiliating for these countries, as was the United Nations' subsequent pronouncement that the Canal belonged to Egypt. To some observers, the conflict surrounding the canal seizure in 1956 seemed pointless, since the original 99-year lease granted by Mohammed Said to Ferdinand de Lesseps was set to expire in 1968. At that time, ownership of the canal would have reverted to Egypt anyway. More than a century had passed since Ferdinand de Lesseps began his campaign to build the Suez Canal. The statue erected in his honor at the entrance to the canal in Port Said had, to many Egyptians, become a symbol of Egypt's long and bitter history of subjugation to foreign powers. A few months after Egypt seized the canal, nationalist Egyptians used dynamite to knock the statue off its pedestal. It had taken a century, but now, for the first time, Egypt owned it all. Gamal Abdel Nasser got his S1 dam, and he didn't need the revenues from the Suez Canal to pay for it. Much to the dismay of the Western powers, the Soviets stepped forward and put up the money for construction. Egypt was on a roll. Within a decade, she had overthrown the monarchy, negotiated her independence, seized control of the Suez Canal, and begun construction on a dam that would eventually double her agricultural output. The nation that for centuries had been ruled by foreigners now stood firmly at the helm of its own destiny. By 1966, over 20,000 ships were moving through the canal annually. They carried 242 million tons of cargo and 40% of Europe's oil imports. Then in 1967, war broke out with Israel. The conflict lasted only six days, but it left Israel in control of the Sinai Peninsula just across the canal. The Egyptians sunk ships in the canal to keep out Israeli gunboats, turning it into a watery no man's land. The canal remained closed for eight years. The loss to Egypt was devastating, two billion dollars in uncollected tolls. When the canal opened in 1869, the cross-section of the waterway measured 300 square meters. Over the next 80 years, it was enlarged seven times. When it was nationalized in 1956, the canal measured 1,200 square meters. The new Egyptian owners then increased it again to 1,800 square meters. When the canal reopened in 1975, the size of an average ocean-going freighter or tanker had increased substantially. Since that time, the canal has undergone constant expansion. Until today, it can accommodate 97% of the world's commercial fleet. Even when it's not being expanded, the canal undergoes daily dredging to keep up with erosion and the constantly blowing desert sands. 
Fewer ships travel through the canal today than did 30 years ago because today's ships carry much larger cargoes. When he was planning the Suez Canal, Ferdinand de Lesseps envisioned a truly international enterprise, open to ships of all flags. Since the canal's reopening in 1975, it has remained true to that vision. Egypt owns and operates the canal, but in a sense, it belongs to the world. Each morning, well before dawn, ships gather at the northern and southern gates to the Suez Canal. Here, they are arranged in convoys. The canal is only wide enough for one-way traffic, but there are bypasses similar to railroad sidings. We have five bypasses along the canal where we can allow bypassing in, in, the, in the bypass. And for that reason, we are making synchronization of the entrance of the convoy from the north and from the south so that the meeting can occur in the bypass. We have two convoys from the north and one convoy from the south. Each ship is assigned English-speaking Egyptian pilots for the 15-hour passage. They are guided through the canal by four pilots. One ticket from the sea, from the waiting area, to the entrance of the canal is called a road pilot. And then another pilot, it's called canal pilot ticket, from one entrance of the canal to the middle of the canal here in Ismailia. It's a change the pilot ticket, another pilot to the other entrance, and then a road pilot ticket to the sea. Each vessel passing through the canal is monitored from this control station at the Suez Canal headquarters in Ismailia. Downstairs from the control room is the canal pilot training center and wheelhouse simulator. City course 350, sir. City. City 350. Each canal pilot takes a refresher course in the simulator three times a year. This simulator is designed to meet all demands of the navigation, navigator officers and pilots for training in radar uh, plotting, collision avoidance, maneuvering, navigation, and updating sk their skills. In 1869, the year the Suez Canal opened, its original architect, Ferdinand de Lesseps, married for the second time. He was by then 64 years old. He and his young wife proceeded to have 11 children. Ten years later, at the age of 74, he began work on a project to build a canal in Panama, but found he no longer had the stamina. Others completed what he began. He died in 1894 at the age of 89. The Suez Canal today has turned out to be just what de Lesseps had hoped for, a path of trade and communication open to all. It is unfortunate that, in spite of his vision and efforts, his name became synonymous in the Egyptian psyche with centuries of colonial rule and the image of outsiders exploiting a poor country and her few natural resources. But the fact remains that de Lesseps, despite his sometimes questionable methods, was the visionary and prime mover of the Suez Canal excavation. Without his energy and determination, the project might not have been attempted for decades or at all. Le canal de Suez.